Well, hello church, it's good to be able to be back again. Um, as many of you know, Michelle and I were off for a couple weeks, or I was off for a couple weeks. During the first a week that we were away, we had some amazing weather. We had the opportunity for Michelle and I just to get out in nature, enjoy some of God's creation by ourselves. Just an absolutely incredible time looking around and seeing the things that God has made and just being reminded of His majesty, of His goodness, who He is. But it's always good to be able to be back with you and be communicating with you again. And even though we're not together physically, to be able to say, you know what, we have the opportunity to speak to you and to be together with one another and just being together. And uh, we're currently always looking for situations and we're looking for ways that we can be communicating to you effectively even though we're not together in person. I really miss being together, miss shaking hands with you. For some of you, miss giving you hugs, for standing around, being together, having coffee together, just talking and joking and seeing each other physically. But right now, this is the best that we can do. And so we're excited about the fact that we can be communicating with you in this week. As a church, it's our desire, as leadership, it's our desire that we would, as a church, be continually trying to encourage and trying to, to build each other up in life and faith and be all that God has called us to be as the church. And we're excited to be able to be doing this through these forms of, of media. And like I said, we're continually trying to explore new ways that that can be done. Um, we're excited about meeting together on Sunday mornings. We want to encourage you as an individual, as a couple, as a family, to be coming together on Sundays as we continue this series that we're going through, as we have the opportunity to be touching base with one another in uh, just various forms. It's hard to believe that with all the changes that are going on around us right now, that this coming Friday is, is Good Friday. And again, we are, are excited about being able to come together, to meet together, to be remembering the death of Jesus Christ and all that that means. To know that because he died, we can have forgiveness. And then we're even more excited about that following Sunday coming together on Sunday morning and rejoicing in the fact that we don't serve a Savior who's dead, but we serve a living Savior. And so want to uh, encourage you as much as we possibly can to, to meet with us those two times, next Friday and this coming Sunday after that. Want to thank you as a church to be as you continually giving to the church ministries here. And even though we're not carrying out ministries around us as we normally have been doing, uh, we continue to look for avenues that we can be the church in the situation that God has planned us. And your gifts and your givings allow us to be able to continue to do that. So what we want to do is we want to pray. We want to launch into what we have this morning in regards to some testimony, but also looking into God's word together. So let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you that you have given us the ability to meet by this way. We thank you for each other that we can encourage one another in faith and in life. God, we thank you that you are a rock and a refuge, one who does not change, but one who is constant. We pray that as we spend these next few minutes together, uh, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, that as a church you would build your church, that we would be encouraged in heart. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Whoa! 
washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come of your way among us, welcome you A good shout out to Rich and all his crew for keeping us connected in unique ways. And, you know, I was so excited to get back from the South and see my church family and my kids and my grandkids, but God had other plans. And at first I was afraid, you know, the doctors asked us to put out posts on social media about um, social distancing and all that's coming. And, you know, one of my daughters is ready to deliver by Sarah's section. The other one's a critical care nurse. My mom's in a care home and you listen to the news. Man, it was hard not to be afraid. And I wasn't so much afraid for myself, but for the suffering of the world, it was so burdening. And But I know that God is on the throne and he will use uh, the suffering for his glory. And we can find comfort in his word. And what a time to be still before God. And, um, you know, we have time to train as, as prayer warriors. And um, last Saturday, there was a fasting and prayer all across Canada. It was awesome. But... Lots of us have been talking on the phone lately, and many have told me they, they're a bit dry and empty. And Andrew Murray, an old theologian, uh, he taught me that it's the Holy Spirit that leads us, guides us, and brings us close to the Father. And so when I'm feeling like I don't want to pray as much, you know, I ask him to empty me and fill me with the fullness of God. Ephesians 3 tells us we can be filled with the fullness of God and ask for a thirst for prayer and knowledge and wisdom and after about three days, you know, through the power of the Spirit, nothing on my part, you know, I have a burning desire to enter the throne room. And I know many of you are there right now, and I can't imagine what's happening in the heavenly realms. You know, it gives me goosebumps, and may it all be for the glory of God. And, you know, may we have a, 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 a harvest of believers across the world and nation in this Comox Valley. And there'll be many seeking after all that's happening. And I pray God would breathe his spirit into the church and release a mighty army because sometimes between the prayer and the answer is our greatest hour. And I'm praying that this is the church's greatest hour. I'm praying Psalm 91 over my family and 
Let's praise God for his grace and strength and courage, you know, that he gives us. And if we have to suffer, he'll be there. Remember the persecuted. They have a, a double burden right now. Some of the refugee camps are just rampant with uh, coronavirus. Um, they can't social distance. They have no Tylenol. Pray for the workers on the field. And Well, it's such a long list, but I'm supposed to keep this short. And I've already done it once, and it was too long. So I just want to end with, you know, if you're afraid, that's okay. God will meet you there. He met me there, and he meets me there again and again. And, you know, we may not be able to uh, go out right now, but we can wage a war uh, in world events in prayer. And we can get ready as a church for this to be our greatest hour, because when this is over, there's going to be a lot of work to do. I just want to end with the blessing that God gave Moses that I think is so beautiful, and he prayed it over all of uh, his people, Aaron did. And it says, may you bless us, Lord, and keep us. May your face shine upon us, and may you be gracious to us. May you lift your countenance upon us, and may you give us peace. See you all soon. Good morning, church. I love this place. It's on the way up Forbidden Plateau, the road going to the old ski hill. I always drive right by slow down enjoy the view i thought what a great place to come and share god's word this morning the beautiful landscape it's a bit of an escape from life isn't it and uh sometimes i imagine what if you could just impose the peace that you have here on all of life <sighs> that would be a breath of fresh air just to erase our calm, erase our troubles, bring in calm, everything would be fine. When we look at the troubles, we're always looking for a cure. Like right now, our biggest solution, if we could just find a vaccine, everything would be okay. We look at other troubles. Could you have a vaccine against war? Man, that would be nice. Malnutrition, famine, poverty, slavery, malaria, so many big issues in our world. What if there was a vaccine for loneliness? That would be all right. Um, something, a, a pill, just so that we felt like we belonged and we knew that we had a place in this world, then everything would be okay, wouldn't it? Or would it? You see, if we solve one problem, we haven't really got to the root of the issue something else will always rise up as priority. I believe that each person on this planet's desperately looking to see this broken world fixed. We desperately need a cure. And in religious language, we're asking, who will be our savior? What's going to be our solution? Now, if we did find a cure, a vaccine, a solution to our problems. What would you do with that? It's back and it's relax. No, you'd spread the word. You'd find a way to access it. You'd, you'd do all that you could, right? Expectantly pursue it. You know that it's the cure you're expecting and then you pursue it because it's the right thing. And this morning's Palm, we're talking about Palm Sunday. This great day where Jesus comes and he enters into Jerusalem. And our response today, I pray, leads us towards expectantly pursuing him. Now, the issue that the people dealt with in Jesus' day, the biggest thing that made the headlines of the news all the time was Roman occupation. They had no freedom in their own land. The freedom they had was just a charade. They, they couldn't come and go as they wished. They were always under the watchful eye of the Roman armies. And so when Jesus came and he spoke about peace, crowds were drawn in. They anticipated, this is it. This is the solution. This will solve all of our problems. And the calendar tells us today's Palm Sunday, the day where Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Rather than staying on the outskirts, he knew now was his time. And the reason he entered was to do the work his father had called him to do. His time had now come. And he came knowing full well that people there 
wanted him dead. And yet he entered Jerusalem. In Luke 9, 51, it says he set his face toward it. He determined because that was his mission. That is why he came. So we're going to read through the book of Luke, chapter 19. Uh, each of the Gospels tells this story of Jesus entering Jerusalem. In Luke 19, 28 to 44, it says, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully praising God, loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem, and he saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you and when your enemy will build embarkment against you and encircle and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Go find a donkey, he says. Bring it here. What's the significance of a donkey? Well, some speculate, well, kings, they'd ride out to war on a horse. They'd ride in on peace on a donkey. And Jesus here was speaking about peace. He was coming to bring peace. Uh, Zechariah 9.9, 9, it tells us, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes riding to you victorious and righteous, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The humility of Jesus. The donkey, more the commoner means of transportation. Here comes Jesus, humbly, announcing peace as he enters Jerusalem. And why go to Jerusalem? People there want him dead. They're plotting to kill him. So he'd been staying secluded away, avoiding the major centers of the world because his time had not yet come. But Jesus knew his purpose. In Luke 4.18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to the proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recover sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to fulfill his purpose. Jesus was coming to do his Father's will, and he knew that the cross lay before him, and it was his time now. And as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he came to do his Father's will, how did the crowds respond? You see, the world anticipates a savior. They, they desperately want solutions to their brokenness, and so they started praising. They recognized Jesus as someone special. They knew he was coming to accomplish God's will, so they're shouting out and they're praising. I believe that each and every one of us desperately wants a solution. We desire the redemption that Jesus brings. We want the reconciliation between us and God and the world around us. We recognize the world is broken and falling apart. And each person on this planet, regardless of who they are, wants to see things fixed. Everyone's looking for some sort of utopia, right? They just want life better. 
some security, some pleasure, belonging, purpose. And often it's more than just solve the problems because we recognize this world we're living in is broken. But we want a place in this world. Belonging is so important. Some just de describe belonging as more than just having a connection right now in the present, but knowing that I have a future here. And when they recognized Jesus, they said, we can get on board with this guy. This guy can give us a future. He is the one where we could belong, where we could see a future for ourselves. And not only belonging, but a purpose, a meaning larger than just the day in and the day out of life. That's why the crowds were rejoicing. Don't we all want purpose in life? I remember a number of years back, my son's grade seven grad. And each of the grads from grade seven before they went off to high school got to say a few words. And almost every single one of them said, when I grow up, I want to start a nonprofit. And they listed the various areas of the world they wanted to make better. I don't know if they just had a class on nonprofits and the importance of that, but it showed me that we all want to see this world a better place and we want a purpose. We want to be involved. We want to have an aspect of saying, I'm helping be part of the solution and not the problem. And that's why I see the crowds joining together to follow Jesus, proclaiming his excitement and announcing him as their leader, as their Lord, as their King, because they wanted purpose and they recognized Jesus could bring that. They wanted in, they wanted part of what he was doing. So in Luke, they were all shouting, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory in the highest. In Matthew, at the same story, he records it a little different. And they're all shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is not really a word that we use today in our shouts of exclamation and praise. It literally means save, rescue, or savior. And, and in the Hebrew scriptures, it was always spoken of as if it was a shout of help or save, I pray, rescue me. Imagine the guy on the beach on the deserted island and he's writing in the sand, SOS. A helicopter comes by and he's like, help me, help me, save me. There's this desperation of, please, I need help and I need a savior. Hosanna has that element of desperation of we need a savior. It also isn't just a desperation, but it's an expectation of we're praising God because he is our savior. It's this jubilant exclamation. It's this praise. It's as if there's this sporting event and everyone starts stomp, stomp. We will, we, okay, I'm not even going to try and sing it, right? But they're all cheering. Let's go, Jesus. Let's go. We will rock you. We will conquer. We are here. And we know that Jesus is the one. And so they're shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of David. They're referring to him as a king, as to him who will rule. It's this declaration, assuming victory and cheering Jesus on. And so they bring their palm branches. They lay them out on the ground. They have their cloaks. They put them down, giving Jesus the red carpet. And there they are. They're so excited. They're anticipating the great work that God is doing. They desperately realize they need a savior. If you saw a solution, what would your response be? <sighs> Not at all. You'd be on the edge of your seat. You'd be saying, let's bring it on. That, yeah, I want in on this. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When you recognize the problem and you see a solution, you see the Savior coming, the response is an expectant pursual, an expectation of going, yes, this is it. And then pursuing it, saying, I want in. I need to be part of this. And now is our season as a church to shout out Hosanna. Save us. And not just save us in desperation if we need saving, but rescue us because we know you are the Savior. Now is our season. Are you expectantly pursuing Jesus? 
Serious. How has your life changed in the last few weeks? Have you come to your knees crying out to Jesus saying, we need you? We, 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 we are our only hope. We have nothing else. What will it take for us as a people to be broken before Jesus? Not just to carry on with life as normal, our busyness and our to and fro and accomplishing this and that, but actually stop. And in our stopping, not just to go back to our, oh, I've got this, I'll figure it out, or, or go into fear and worry, but to shout out, Hosanna, save us, rescue us, and we know that you can. Will you turn to Jesus? It doesn't happen just automatically. In your heart, you need to be broken and realize you are my only hope. And I pray that this season of life, for us as a church, that we'll be a people who are expectantly pursuing Jesus together so that he can be transforming us, changing us, and drawing us to dependence on him. Jesus entered Jerusalem to fulfill his purpose. The crowds recognized that and they desperately realized we need this Savior. So they shouted out and praised saying, Hosanna. But not everyone was pursuing Jesus. Not everyone was there. The Pharisees in the crowd were skeptical. Many of us, yeah, we carry on and we know life is crazy and we don't know what's happening anymore. We turn to our news sources and we just want to understand and, and know what ways up. Sometimes we don't recognize that Jesus can actually be our Savior. And we, we doubt and we're like, really? What, what's he going to do for me today? But look to him. Seek him and you will find him. I, I don't know what the Pharisees were so much skeptical that Jesus could do things. They'd seen his miracles. They'd recognized his power. The problem for them was a power struggle. Who's going to be Savior? Because when this world has its troubles, who's going to fix it? And the Pharisees were part of the institution of religion saying, we've got this. So when Jesus came along as Savior, they said that was a threat to the power they held in society. See, we all want to cure, but the question is, who's going to be in charge? And in your life, are you going to surrender or are you going to maintain control? And control either looks like I'm dominating and I've got this. Control also means I'm fearful. I'm grasping for control and I've lost it. Fear is still a control issue. The Pharisees were against Jesus. And they said to him, Jesus, those disciples of yours, silence them. Re rebuke them. They shouldn't be praising like this. The world wants to silence the church. The devil wants to silence the church. But Jesus said to the Pharisees, even if they are quiet, the rocks will cry out. Nothing can thwart God's purposes. Nothing can stop God's plans. Can you hear it? Even the rocks are going to cry out. I didn't quite hear it, but I think because the church is still praising. The world wants to stop the praises of God's people, but nothing can stop it. Someone recently wrote, um, it's been attributed to C.S. Lewis, I googled that, it wasn't actually the case, this was written recently. Someone wrote in the voice of Satan saying, I will cause anxiety, fear, and panic. I will shut down businesses, schools, places of worship and sports events, I will cause economic turmoil, and Jesus responds, I will bring together neighbors, restore the family unit, I'll bring dinner back to the kitchen table, I'll help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters, I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world, I will teach my children to trust me and not their money and their material resources. Isn't that God's specialty? Taking things that are broken and mending them? taking chaos and bringing order, taking this world that's in upheaval and bringing about his good purposes, that's what God will do. So Jesus says, even if his people are silent, the rocks will cry out because nothing can thwart God's purposes. 
A virus won't stop the church. Wars can't stop the church. Persecution won't stop the church. Even when a society is bent on eliminating the voice of God through the church, Jesus says he will build his church and the gates of hell can't even prevail. Are we going to thrive as a church? We're not going to meet together likely for a few months now. What's going to happen to us? I've had a number of people text me, email me, phone me and say, what do you think is going to happen? Here we are, we're sitting in our living rooms, we watch church for a little while. Will that carry on? Or we'll just kind of get bored of that. And when we come back, we're so comfortable sitting in our living rooms watching YouTube. What's going to happen to the church? Are we going to come back together? I know that God's purpose is for us to thrive. Not just to limp through this season, but to actually grow, to develop, to thrive as a church. And I'm anticipating when we gather again together, however many months it will be from now, we'll look around and we'll see God has done something special in our midst. God has built us up, strengthened us, and done something amazing. And as we recognize Jesus as our Savior, we're expectantly pursuing Him, releasing the cares and the worries of the world, setting aside our false comforts and securities and turning to Him. So don't be silent. If we're silent, the rocks will cry out, God will find a way for His name to be praised. But as a church, let's praise Him. Let's jubilant explanations of praise. And learn in all of our language when we're talking to people and we're with our families and we're um, speaking with others, that we learn how to speak and interpret life through a lens of recognizing, yes, everything's in chaos, but God brings order. God does a good and wonderful work. Jesus carries on his journey towards Jerusalem. The crowds are praising, the Pharisees are scoffing. They must have come to a crest of the hill and they look and they see all ahead of them, the city of Jerusalem in all of its splendor. The crowd dies down. Jesus stops and he looks and he has a moment. And in that moment, Jesus weeps. He just broke down and he cried. He wept because he saw the people of the city. He knew these are God's covenant people, and yet they'd reject him. Jesus knew that as he went to bring them peace, they'd fight against him and kill him. He came to bring the rule of God, and they'd crucify him. And as people reject God, Jesus knows that brings punishment. So he weeps because God was going to bring punishment on that city, and Jesus announced its destruction. Now, how did Jesus feel about this punishment? He broke down and he wept. What about the Father? What about God Almighty? What did he think of this judgment? God doesn't delight in evil and judging. Sometimes we have this view of, there's God, he's like, Ooh, I can hardly wait for them to do something wrong and zap them with lightning. Judgment, hell, fire, brimstone. Yes, we read about God's judgment in the Bible. It's very real is very terrifying, but how does God feel about it? He feels so strongly about judgment that out of love for people, he sent his one and only son to give his life, to be a ransom for many. He sent Jesus to the cross to bear our sin, to take our punishment, to take the wrath of God upon himself so that we could be, have peace so that we could be made right with God. God does not delight in evil. God does not delight in judging. So he goes out of his way. God purposes to do everything to put our sin upon himself, to set us free. That's the grace and the love of God that we see. And yet, even though God has gone so far to bring the judgment upon his own son, people still reject him. They still turn their backs on him. They can't accept that. They say, I need to be in control. I can take care of this on my own. How hard it is for us as people to accept help. 
I've heard that many times in conversations with you on the phone the last couple of weeks. My neighbor helped me out. And man, it's so hard to receive help. And it is, right? Because receiving help is surrendering, saying, I can't do this. For whatever reason, I'll accept your help. And that's what God is doing. He's saying, let go and surrender. Allow me to be your savior. And surrender means we have to let go of our pride. We have to let go of ourself. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew that the people would reject him and judgment would come. And literally that happened just a handful of decades later in the year AD 70. Early historians estimate that over a million Jews were killed as their city was destroyed. And Jesus says, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and hem you in on every side. They'll dash you to the ground and you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus entering Jerusalem was the time of God's coming to them. Jesus entering Jerusalem to take his, our sin upon his shoulders was the time of God's coming for you and for me. Jesus came to bring peace and they'd reject him. So Jesus wept because he knew that meant punishment. What a contrast that is. Jesus giving his life, even though people, he knew people would reject him. He would give his life, even though that rejection would bring his own death. And in them rejecting them, it would bring his, their own destruction. Jesus says, you spit, you mock, you beat me, you turn your back on me. He weeps and he goes to the cross anyway. This whole great celebration of the crowds following Jesus, shouting out, Hosanna, went into the city. The crowd scattered and they left. We want the gifts that Jesus brings. We want his healing. We want his life. We want his peace. We want his purpose. But we look and we see the way of the cross. It just doesn't make sense. I want, I want the good parts, but to go through the suffering? No, thank you. I'll take the glory on the other side. I'll, I'm all about resurrection. But rejection, suffering and death, we just don't want it. We just, we, we'd rather overcome with power and might and let's accomplish this. But Jesus is calling us to surrender. To surrender to him because his way of laying down his life humbly before us to the cross taking our death upon himself so that we could have life, then Jesus in might and power overcame. He conquered the grave. I'm so looking forward to next week where we celebrate Good Friday and Easter. It's an amazing week in our calendar where we remember the victory of Jesus. But today is Palm Sunday, this day of great celebration, of anticipating, here's Jesus, the coming King. And when you know there's a coming King, expectantly pursue him. And I pray that'll be your heart today, that you, your whole life will expectantly pursue Jesus as you recognize him as that great king and you'll declare his praises and as a church we'll grow and we'll thrive. I pray that's been an encouragement to you to expectantly pursue Jesus. Hope you've enjoyed the backdrop up here in the hills. You may even see a, snow, a few snowflakes coming by on this cool crisp morning. But let me pray for us together as a church. Father God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to bring us peace. And as he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, we recognize and we anticipate the wonderful week that we're looking forward to with Easter and Good Friday. We know the troubles of this world. We recognize Jesus as the Savior. And so teach us to expectantly pursue him. Cause us as a church to thrive as we pursue Jesus in our lives. And we exclaim and praise, Hosanna, save us, dear Lord. Amen. Have a wonderful week and uh, stay in touch with one another. Take care.